so my talk actually um, it's going back to the talk we had the first day so it's about ultra cold atoms so it's neutral particle in the gas phase uh, that we can trap typically with laser light so this is what uh, it's kind of your imagination should point to and my talk start a little bit where uh, the very nice talk from Tillman and Louise stopped so Tillman and Louise I mean I've shown you something uh, which I also <laughs> I'm very convinced uh, that, that these uh, strongly magnetic uh, atomic species, which are relatively new in the field of ultra cold atom, are actually great uh, for uh, many uh, applications. So I think, I mean, uh, to summarize uh, the take-home message maybe from Tillman and, uh, and Luis, uh, so they are great because you can study dipolar properties in the quantum regime, and these dipolar properties can, be, uh, can give rise to phenomena, both at the two body level or three body, let's say few body, how these atoms interact, but also, I mean, um, because of our setting, you can have also phenomena which are many body, in which kind of all the atoms are participating together to this phenomena, which are dipolar, so it's a long range interaction, as, as we saw many times, and is anisotropic. And we can control by controlling, for example, uh, the, the angle um, which set the anisotropy. So another thing which make this atom very special is that they are atom. So somehow in, uh, we learn uh, in the last 30 years, so the first Bose-Einstein condensate uh, in, uh, in, in gas uh, have been done uh, almost uh, 30 years ago. And, uh, and we our community know very well all the technique to cool down this system. And so we can use now all this technique to go a step further and to try to, let's say, condense or study atomic species which are much more complex than the one originally considered. And then we have a, a very nice control of the interaction between the particle. I mean, this is uh, what also Tillman uh, and, uh, and Luis told you. I mean, the interaction between the atom, the two body interaction can be described by pseudo potential. The system is weakly interacting, so you have a type of mean field approach. You can calculate many things and actually very good. And, um, and the interaction has one part, which is a point-like interaction, very short range, coming from the Van der Waals interaction. And there is another part, which is the dipole-dipole, that comes from the fact that this specific class of atom is strongly magnetic. This is a little bit a summary, I mean, of uh, some very important properties of such atoms or atomic species that, uh, I mean, uh, in previous talk have been already uh, discussed. So, but then my question is, are we hiding something? So, because so far we said, okay, these atoms are really great and it's uh, easy, we can work with them, everything can be, um, let's say, modeled by mean field interaction and so. But then you might ask, for example, if you look at this, the atomic species under study, erbium and dysprosium, which are, uh, so Tillman spoke about dysprosium and, uh, and uh, Luis uh, about both of them. So, you might kind of think about, but which are the atomic properties of this atom? Or for example, why do these atoms are so magnetic? What makes this atom so special that we can see dipolar interaction? And since this is a school, uh, I thought really to <laughs> have a very tutorial, uh, let's say basic uh, summary of why these atoms are so magnetic, why they are so interesting, and how can we actually do quantum physics with them. So where the magnetism come from? Okay, so in the periodic table, uh, dysprosium and terbium are the most magnetic one. They are both come, and the uh, erbium is also extremely magnetic, and they all belong to a family which is called lanthanide. So it's on the back of the, the lower part of the periodic table. And so lanthanide are very special. They are known uh, very well, I mean, in scattering physics, and they belong to the so-called F block of the periodic table. So now I want to tell you that also these atoms are the last one to be both condensed in our community. Indeed, if we look from the first Bose-Einstein condensate up to today, that's how time and condensation proceed. So the colored uh, atomic species are the ones which have up to now been both condensed in some of the lab around the world. So the first comment which I always make, especially when uh, there are a lot of young people, is that there is a lot of white space, guys, so there is a lot to work on. 
And the second uh, comment is that uh, um, there is a color code, you know, yellow, blue, red, and so on. What does color code stand for? So the, the things I've decided to uh, so use the color code to highlight some properties. So for example, if we go to the yellow atoms, which are the alkaline atoms, so these are very nice for quantum many body phenomena in which the interaction between the atom is uh, basically only due to the short range Van der Waals potential. So those are a neutral atom, the potential is 1 r to the 6. You can parameterize everything with a very nice parameter which we call scattering lens and you can even change the scattering lens just by changing the magnetic field. Then for example the green one is helium, so it's two electron atom. And the helium have a speciality that the Bose-Einstein condensate have been done not in the ground state, uh, but in a metastable state, so in a kind of a ex electronically excited state. And then you have the blue one, which are, uh, um, let's say, also two electron uh, atom. I mean, and the uh, ytterbium is be so belonging to this class because it's behaving like. Uh, and it's very nice because uh, in the ground state, all the quantum numbers are zero from an atomic point of view. Okay, so they can very uh, use it, I mean, uh, to very precise clock transition just because the ground state is magnetic insensitive. And then you have the red one, which are these dipolar atom, and we will focus more in this dysprosium and erbium, and in particular in erbium. These atoms have very strong magnetic moment. So, and the speciality of this atom is the electronic configuration. So now I'm just uh, speaking about atomic physics. So these atoms are multi electron atom. They have several elect valence electrons. How do they fill the electronic shell? So let's say standard atomic physics. <coughs> so, and you see that there is a core, as usual, a noble gas core. And, uh, and then they have a uh, el valence electron in two different shells. A S shell, which is rounded, symmetric, OK? Is the usual S shell you have in alkali, for example. And then there is an inner shell which is this F. And this is very special because F is a highly anisotropic electronic shell. So if you have a core, the electrons in the F shell will move in a very anisotropic way. And because of this, all the quantum numbers involved for this atom are very, very high. And uh, indeed, if you compare uh, to alkali, uh, you see that it's very different because alkali have only one electron vacancy in the symmetric S shell. So as a consequence, when you have to change your mind from, let's say, single valence electron to multivalence electron atom, you know that the atomic spectrum is getting very complex with many lines. And this is the case for erbium and dysprosium. This is just an example. All of these levels that you see here are electronically excited levels. Okay? And so this is the reason why it took so much time, I think, to get Bose-Einstein condensation of lanthanide, just because uh, with respect to alkali, in which you have only basically two levels, or I mean three levels important, uh, here you have many more levels. And so this was a little bit scary. But actually what the community then find out is that this complexity also give you richness, because you can really then say, OK, I choose really the, atom the transition I want for laser cooling, which have exactly the properties that I want. And this is possible, because each of these optical transition will have a different strengths. And so you can say, OK, for these laser cooling things, I need these strengths. Let's see where I find the transition. J, J plus 1, and then I choose this transition. So this is kind of then everything it's uh, uh, making, ev everything it's getting much uh, easier because you can simply forget about the many other transition and focus on the one you want. As I said, the vacancy in this inner shell is very special. And so as a consequence, the quantum number to describe this very anisotropic electron movement around the core uh, need very high quantum number. So the orbital motion is uh, anisotropic. Complete the orbital quantum number, L, it's very high. Okay? And so that means that in the ground state, they are not S state like alkali. Okay? They have some orbital anisotropy in the electronic ground state. And so because of the high quantum number, there is a lot of consequence. Because of this high quantum number, uh, when you think about the spin state uh, related to the ground state, uh, so you see that you have a lot of different spin state in the ground state. And you can study spin physics. So the bosonic one realizes a spin six system. If you look at the ground state of the fermionic atom, everything is even more <laughs> complex. 
because uh, the hyperfine stay, because the fermions do have an hyperfine structure, so you have all this hyperfine level, and then if you apply a magnetic field around, you have all the Zeeman sublevel, and all together it means that in the ground state, you have at least for erbium 104 uh, sublevel. Okay? But because you are working at very low temperature with very high spectral resolution of your laser, so you can really selectively address one of the state in the way you want. Okay? Most of the physics I will uh, discuss you is always in the lower Siemens sublevel. And then, of course, I mean, there is the other consequence to have the large magnetic moment. So what is a magnetic moment? So how do you write down the magnetic moment? Basically, it's only a combination of quantum number. Okay? So uh, for a right combination, you can have the magnetic moment very high. And larger is the vacancy, as a general rule, larger is the vacancy in the F shell. So F shell, to be filled, you need 14 electrons. Okay? So less filled is this F shell, more magnetic is the atomic species. Okay? So and here, are, for example, the magnetic moment or all the lanthanide. What is also very interesting in the lanthanide, which uh, I want just for, as a curiosity point out, is that if you take erbium, erbium has a lot of isotopes, so you have bosonic atom and fermionic atom. If you go to holmium, the one next, has only one isotope. If you go to dysprosium, have many isotopes, terbium, only one, gadolinium, many isotopes, and so on and so forth. So there is, I mean, a lot of pattern in this lanthanide family. So, but what this first introduction, I want to, let's say, welcome this new <laughs> atomic species to you, and I think that the take-home message before even entering to, let's say, quantum physics, is that in this type of atoms, you have two contributions to the anisotropy. One is coming from the dipole-dipole interaction that we discussed many times because of the large magnetic moment, but on top of this uh, dipolar anisotropy, which refers to a long-range potential, you have also the orbital anisotropy that refer to the short range part and it's due to the fact that the <coughs> orbital quantum momentum of your atom is extremely large. Okay? So you have anisotropy everywhere somehow in this type of atoms. So these have a lot of consequences in the scattering physics, in the molecular physics and the molecular spectrum of these atoms, but I will not uh, enter to this. So the talk of, uh, of Tillman and uh, Louis focused on the bosonic isotope and showed this many body effect with bosons, with dipolar bosons. And now, I mean, what I would like to move on is what about fermions, okay? So because, as you know, we have neutral particle, but if you change the isotope, you can change also the statistics. So you can have atomic bosons, do Bose-Einstein condensate, or you can have an, is uh, an isotope which have a fermionic nature, and then you can do degenerate Fermi gas, really like textbook object. Okay, you can define a Fermi surface, uh, the, the fermions that uh, do respect the Pauli principle, and, uh, and all these Fermi statistical uh, rules. And so in our experiment, which work on erbium, so of course we, have, uh, we can produce Bose-Einstein condensate. We can even assemble two highly magnetic atoms and form a molecule, very, very weakly bound. And so this is also very interesting. Or we can uh, study fermions. And this talk basically will only focus on the fermionic uh, experiment. So, and now I want to give you an historical step back. The first Bose-Einstein condensation, so entering the quantum regime with bosons, and so Bose-Einstein condensation, has been done in 95. But the first uh, degenerate Fermi gas have been done four years after. And then you might ask, why were the people at that time lazy with fermions, or there is a, so let's say, a, a scientific reason for that? And actually, there is a scientific reason. And the person who really pioneered the field of fermions is, uh, maybe some of you know, is uh, Debbie Jean, which unfortunately left us uh, last year. And so she was really pushing the, film of the, uh, the field of degenerate Fermi gas. She was able, together with the group, to, for the first time, really go to the degenerate regime with fermions. But still, why four years? I mean, wh what, what is different in between these two species? And it's really the statistics and uh, the Fermi statistic that play a role. Let me explain you why. This is a, a very simple to understand. So we have a, a gas of atom very hot. How do we cool down these gas of atoms? At the beginning, 
uh, you don't care about statistics. All the atoms, I mean, let's say, g gas in a box, all the atoms follow the Maxwell distribution. Fine. Then you cool down. Maybe with laser light, you apply the so-called uh, laser cooling. So with light, you can slow down the atom. Everything is working almost equally for fermions and bosons at this point. But then light is not enough. Laser cooling is not enough, and you have to do the next step uh, of cooling. What is the next step? It's called in our field evaporative cooling. What is about this? You take the distribution of atoms. So this is, let's say, as a function of velocity, Maxwell type distribution. So you see that your atomic gas, uh, I mean, uh, you have several uh, probability to have in several velocity class. And evaporative cooling is working like this. I am able, believe me, to remove the tail with the larger velocity, so hottest atom. I can do this. And then what do I need? Uh, now this point is just a truncated uh, non-equilibrium distribution. What do I need to get in equilibrium? The young guy, what do I need? Wait, to wait, wait for what? Until they thermalize, but how do they thermalize? By interaction, uh, so by collision. That's true. And so then they will be able to re-thermalize, and then you have a narrower distribution, and the temperature is given, let's say, you can, um, you can extract the temperature. But then what is crucial is if these atoms want or not to collide, so to thermalize, to collide, to have elastic collision, and boson do want to do this, uh, and the parameters that tells you how willing are our atom to, to make elastic collision and so to thermalize is the cross-section, elastic cross-section. And now comes the very disappointing aspect. And the disappointing aspect is that the fermions have absolutely no willingness to, at all to thermalize because of statistics. OK? So when you go to low temperature, this cross-section decreases enormously. So you would then, what, what would you do? You would cut here. And then more and more you go to low temperature, less the atomic sample will re-thermalize. It will stay out of equilibrium without ther thermalizing. Then you can cut more, more, more. At the end, you end up with one atom hot. Kind of you. <laughs> this is not what you want, because you want a lot of atoms. You have want quantum gas, many body quantum gas. And so this was already observed back in 99 by the group of Debbie Jean and, and then the time Brian DeMarco was there. And then you see that here um, uh, it's the plot of the elastic cross-section. And if you have identical fermions, OK, so they, they don't want to collide. Uh, and the elastic cross-section with temperature goes to 0. So at some point, this evaporative cooling doesn't work anymore. How, what do we do? Do we give up? Yeah. What is the weaker threshold law? Uh, yeah, it's this one. This is <laughs> give you the weaker threshold. It's the elastic oh, cross-section. Yeah. Yes, it's, uh, it's the equivalent. And then, I mean, uh, uh, Debbie Jean and co-worker, and then later many other group had the idea. Say, so, okay, identical fermions, which I mean, identical, this is uh, how they would, uh, so you see now they are identical in the sense that they are in the same electronic ground state, but they are trapped, so you have also the vibrational state of your trap. This is almost how they want to be at zero temperature, and if you are higher temperature, there are all. OK, but the, the idea was, OK, if now identical fermions then do not want to collide at low temperature, what, what can I do? I can take non-identical fermions. OK, how do I make two identical fermions to become a pair of non-identical fermions? I change the state. For example, I take two different spin states. And now when I take these two different spin states, let's say Z Zeeman sublevel and the next one, to make an example, then the quantum number are different because the Zeeman level is different. And so they will uh, nicely start to collide again. And you see that the cross-section in temperature is, uh, will uh, reach some constant value, finite, big enough to have evaporative cooling. And so then, for this reason, for fermions, we don't speak about evaporative cooling, but we speak about sympathetic cooling. So these two non-identical fermions like each other a lot, and so they, by a sympathy, so by the, their willingness to collide to each other, will re and so this is the sympathetic cooling. Okay? And you can do this by using two different spin states, or two different atomic species, or two different isotopes. And so, and this is, I mean, all the different fermionic species which have been uh, produced uh, in the quantum degenerate regime, which are here listed, so they basically rely on sympathetic cooling. 
But now let's go, let's add dipole-dipole interaction. Okay, so what happens uh, if I have dipole-dipole interaction? Like the key word is the one, I mean, that Ronan already did, uh, said it's Bigner threshold law. Now, the, that, the, the, the difference is that if you have fermions that collide with the short range Van der Waals potential, the usual one, let's say, then all what I said to you, it's true. The elastic cross section goes to zero when the momentum, so decreasing temperature, goes to zero. But if now the interaction among the atom is not short range, but it's long range, the Wigner threshold law change. And you can demonstrate uh, that, that in temperature, it becomes constant with temperature. So suddenly, I have a new, the dipole-dipole interaction reactivates the, the collision between identical fermions. Just because of dipole-dipole, I can now cool down identical fermions. This was not possible before. And so then mm, uh, theorists, uh, Gila, like John Bonn and co-worker and some others, uh, uh, have worked out really the formula for this elastic cross-section in case of dipolar interaction. And then they saw that there is a, a universal law. Okay, so this is a constant. This is the, di the dipolar length that, uh, that Tillman have introduced. Okay, so um, very different system which have the same mm, dipolar lengths would have the same elastic cross-section. So this does not depend on the real detail of the uh, interaction properties. That's why it's universal. And so if you plug in this number for erbium and dysprosium, you see that the elastic cross-section is big enough to actually have efficient evaporative cooling in fermions. Okay, and the, the, so we have done this in our experiment, and there is related wor work in the dysprosium experiment by Benjamin Leffens at Stanford. And so and what we did uh, was exactly to truncate uh, the Boltzmann distribution of velocity and then wait, uh, as uh, your colleague said. And that's exactly what we have done, exactly the same things we do with bosons. Uh, but boson likes to be together and fermions no. And so and then you, you can see that you can very efficiently cool down the temperature. The temperature is related to the width of this uh, object. And then you can even compare how efficient is this direct evaporative cooling between fermions, which is the red, and the bosons. And you see, I mean, I don't want to enter in the detail because <laughs> this is more for specialists. And so, and you see that the efficient of this evaporative cooling is the same for boson and fermions. So we finally have this way uh, to get the, the system um, identical fermion to collide. And of course, that means also the many body level there is dipolar interaction between identical fermions. And then we said, OK, very, very nice. Now let's uh, prove that this universal law is really valid. I mean, this formula that I gave it to you. And so you can, what you can do in our experiment, this is the universal law, and this is the value predicted by this uh, uh, dipolar threshold law. And so what you can do in our experiment, don't look at this graph. Maybe it's too complicated. Basically, you heat up, you have a, gla a gas. And now let's heat up one direction and let's see how it thermalizes in the other. And from the thermalization time, okay, so this is how it re-thermalizes the other direction, you can extract uh, the um, elastic cross-section. So and this is what we have done and the value that we found was really, really in a very good agreement with the universal threshold law. So very happy. Identical fermion can collide, identical fermion can interact, I can use this, and on top of this, there is a universal law that tells me how things are colliding. But then, I mean, as usual in, the, in experiments, some uh, surprise come, because what is important uh, is also the direction of the magnetic field. We have all the dipole, okay, and then external magnetic field will align this dipole. And then uh, you can say, by just by made repeating this experiment, we made a mistake. And we rotated the angle of the magnetic field. And so we saw that then the time of rising, so the time of re rethermalization changed and changed. So there is something which is really depending on how your dipole are oriented, that also tells you how efficiently are this collision and this interaction. And this is a special uh, feature of this anisotropy in the dipole-dipole interaction. And so we studied then this together with Debbie Jean and John Bonn. And so and the, the number of collisions that, so let's say, I don't want to enter in this detail, but the idea is uh, how, do, how efficient is the re 
depend on the angle. And this is the theory that they have done for us. And those are the experiment. OK, and we see, I mean, this is a theory without any fitting parameter. We see very good uh, agreement. Uh, indeed, uh, the anisotropy of the interaction also brings you anisotropy, of course, of, of the way they collide. And so with this, uh, this is the first step, because in this way, we could create a fermionic sample, very cold, of identical fermions, and also extremely dense. For the same parameters of uh, bosonic Bose-Einstein condensate, the density of the fermions is also even higher. Okay? So it's really behaving uh, very well. And now the next step in this um, is uh, to say, OK, all this I told you so far is a few body physics, like uh, how these two atoms collide. Now I want to make another step and go to many body physics. So now Tillman told you uh, very nicely in his talk uh, that to have uh, uh, dipolar effect, to, to have a dipolar effect uh, visible at the many body level, it's depend on the strengths of the other interaction. So Tillman told you that in the case of bosons, you have to compare the strengths of the dipolar interaction with the strengths of the short range interaction. Okay? You can make one very small and so to increase this ratio. When you have fermions, with what do you have to compare? There is no short range interaction, there is only dipolar interaction. When do a fermionic gas uh, is a dipolar, we have a, a dominant dipolar character? And there you end up with one problem, and this that um, in the case of many body physics with fermions, you have to compare the dipolar interaction with the Fermi energy. What is the Fermi energy in a system? It's the kinetic energy. And fermions, since they fill up all the Fermi uh, surface, uh, they have a lot of kinetic energy. Okay? So the Fermi surface, which I'm depicting here, has a lot of kinetic energy. So typically, uh, the strength of the dipolar interaction is much smaller than the Fermi energy, much smaller than the kinetic energy. So it's very hard to see many body phenomena with dipolar fermions. It's really more in the uh, weak interacting regime. But nevertheless, let's see what we would expect if we have a strong enough many-body interaction. So the first things uh, that we would uh, expect, uh, let me, is uh, that the dipole-dipole interaction would uh, change uh, the shape of your Fermi surface. So in all uh, electron, it's very crucial how it is the shape of the Fermi surface. And now you can modify the shape of the Fermi surface. So you know that the fermions are filled up until the Fermi momentum. You can change this, uh, for example, with the lattice. Okay? So with the underlying structure you have in your system. But uh, if you have dipole-dipole interaction, what you get is that since the dipole-dipole interaction it is an isotropic, the Fermi surface itself, uh, which is really a let's say, uh, basic properties of the system can get deformed just due by the interaction. And that this is just true in fermions because it's coming from the exchange interaction between fermions. Okay? And so, and once you have uh, this, uh, uh, let's say, deformed or uh, anisotropic Fermi surface and you think about superconductivity, BCS coupling, so you immediately uh, understand that to enter in the superconductivity regime in the BCS temperature, it's different depending on which direction you would take. So you can start to study, I mean, uh, um, many body phenomena like a BCS state in presence of uh, anisotropy. Okay? And also it's very interesting to see that all the excitation will uh, then have a momentum dependence because of this anisotropy. And so in our case, we wanted to explore this, uh, and we knew that uh, if at all we see a deformation, this will be small, let's say, because of the Fermi energy being very high. And so and what we could do, in, uh, what we can do, everybody in, the, in our community, is to actually map out the momentum distribution. So this is in the momentum space, this is the deformed Fermi surface, and we can map out uh, uh, by looking at an expanded atomic cloud, and I don't want to enter so in, um, in the detail, but in first approximation, the image that you record of the expanding cloud can be one-to-one -one mapped out on the momentum distribution. And then we wanted to probe this anisotropy. And actually, this is what we, we act observed, that the, in momentum space, uh, the surface, the Fermi surface is deformed. 
because here is the ratio between the uh, horizontal to vertical radius. So one would be a spherical Fermi surface, but then when you um, deform in one direction or in the other, you see that it's not anymore spherical. And you can control very precisely in the experiment, I mean, how the deformation process. And of course, uh, this is a, a quantum effect, uh, many body quantum effect. If you now increase the temperature, this effect should vanish. And this is, this is the degree of deformation. And so, which I'm plotting as a function of temperature, we, when I'm not anymore in the degenerate regime, so I'm leaving the Fermi statistic in some, or I mean, I'm not deeply in the Fermi statistic, I see that this deformation wash out. Exactly as you would uh, imagine. And uh, yes. So, and indeed, that would be very interesting to think if uh, also in other systems like uh, in Exiton and so with dipole dipole interaction, the Fermi surface uh, would get the deformation. And in this case, maybe larger because of the larger energy. And you can, uh, by changing the ratio that was density of the um, density multiplied by the dipole moment square divided by the Fermi energy, which is this eta parameter, sorry, I forgot to put here the, the value. By doing this, I can actually change the degree of deformation. So I think that this is a very uh, nice proof of principle experiment that I see I can modify the momentum distribution. Uh, but of course, you have also to notice that the deformation is not very large. OK? And so this is a, maybe at the moment, if I'm not wrong, the only example of many body phenomena with fermions we have uh, uh, in our community. Okay. So now, since we are speaking about fermions, uh, Fermi gas, and so on, um, another thing that you can see is uh, the, that the deformation would reproduce the shape of the anisotropy of the dipole dipole interaction. So if you take the deformation in one direction and in the other, and then you plot it, this is a technique done in solid state, you see that, I mean, the, the, the anisotropy, this is the experiment. Uh, recall uh, really the geometry of the dipole dipole interaction. And now, I mean, uh, this is uh, an example with fermions, and very interesting is now another direction, which is to load these fermions in optical lattice, to have this particle in optical lattice, and study uh, the different Hamiltonian there. And indeed, uh, now in the last part, uh, uh, I would like to briefly tell you about what is about. Uh, a dipolar interaction when you put on a crystal. Let's say this is very much connected with some of the talk we had here. And so in our community, uh, crystal for us uh, is something which have a perfect periodic order, and the crystal is produced by laser light. So if you make interference laser light, uh, you can have a periodic structure of the potential, which is for us the crystal. It's completely free from impurity, do not have phononic excitation, let's say as in a solid state crystal. And with the uh, atoms, ultra cold atoms in the crystal, there have been very beautiful experiments in our community, like studying uh, Bose Abbard uh, or Fermi Abbard type Hamiltonian and seeing the superfluid to mott insulator transition with the system. Or uh, also, I mean, uh, it was possible because, I mean, laser light are comparatively easy to, let's say, shape and change, also to a very exotic geometry, like, for example, the one from the Sangstock group. I mean, like this type of geometry. Or it's possible, instead of putting in the lattice only one spin, to have several spin component. Or it's possible also to add some disorder in the lattice. So all these type of things, uh, it's uh, something that in our community have been achieved. And all these experiments rely on the, dipole di on, the, on the short range contact interaction. And now what we want to do is to kind of go along this line. But instead of having the short range, we want to have a dipolar interaction. This is uh, very interesting. So we have produced this type of three-dimensional lattice, uh, let's say really three-dimensional crystal uh, with laser light in which we have in each lattice side only one atom, one dipole. And then I want to study which are the Hamiltonian describing this type of system, let's say. And now, because you have dipole-dipole interaction, you can imagine that if you have two atoms in the same lattice site, they would also interact uh, by a dipole-dipole interaction. But more importantly, differently from the 
uh, point-like short-range interaction. Now, the dipole-dipole, it's long-range, so that means that also atom in different lattice sites would be able to interact. And not only two of them, but all of them. Okay? So you are kind of, via the interaction, very similar kind of to ion, means string of ion, now you have atom in the neutral atom in the acid that have off-site interaction. This off-site interaction is called a nearest neighbor interaction, dipolar nearest neighbor interaction. Okay. And so now I don't want to enter in the detail, but by adding this type of interaction, the phase diagram uh, of uh, atoms uh, in a crystalline structure or particle in a crystalline structure change enormously. You can have ground state with some pattern. Let's say you can have stripe phase or you can have antiferromagnetic state or you can have checkerboard state. All, um, and, and other exotic phases uh, in how, I mean, the atom align. And so if you write down the Hamiltonian, this is the Hamiltonian that you get is a type of, a, mm, so in this case I'm considering boson, so it's a Bose-Abbard Hamiltonian, but now it's extended by the fact that you have off-site interaction. So the first term is governing the tunneling of atom from one well to another well. The second term, uh, so it's um, this one and this uh, uh, governing the interaction of two atoms in one single lattice side, and then uh, you have the nearest neighbor, as I told you, so interaction between atoms in the different lattice side, and uh, yes. And as you can see here, there is an angle depend, so this off-site depend only on the dipole-dipole because it's the only one long range which connect atoms really seated in different lattice side, and then the also the on-site is depending on the angle, because it's uh, due to the sum of the short range and long range interaction. And what is also nice is that by forcing uh, these two atoms in a single lattice side to be aligned like this, uh, okay, so you have attractive on site interaction. And by forcing to align in the other direction, you would have repulsive dipole dipole interaction. And so, and by uh, changing the parameters of your crystal, you can control from one to the other. But now, I mean, uh, let me just, yeah. It's only dipolar contribute. This V, I, J is the dipolar energy. And also, this is an isotropic, thank you, to point this, because now, if, uh, uh, let's, um, uh, yes, if now <coughs> I have, so the coupling between these, at so if you consider this atom here, Okay, so you can have that depending on in which direction is coupling, it can have either uh, attractive or repulsive uh, off-site interaction. I will show you just now. Indeed, I mean, I want to focus more on the first measurement of this uh, off-site dipolar uh, interaction. And the idea is uh, really the following. If now I have my lattice, I mean, the contrast is not very good. And I put uh, all the atom like this. Huh? Now. The atoms which are aligned along this line, these two, this one will, do, will, uh, will have um, attractive interaction. And this one will have repulsive interaction. So the red is repulsive and this is attractive. So that means if I remove, uh, I mean, uh, or one atom here, uh, this will uh, change uh, the excitation spectrum. So I will show you here. If now I, I remove an atom from here to here, and I do a double occupied site in this direction or in this direction, then uh, the energy, there is an energy difference between these two configurations. Depending on how do I drive the system, and this is what we can control in the experiment. And this uh, energy difference exactly give you the nearest neighbor interaction. All the sites, yes, I would say that uh, in, uh, in MENA, uh, all the sites are uh, occupied. There is unit filling. Uh, how close an accuracy can you get to this? Uh, so, depend on which are your probing tool. Uh, if you have a quantum gas microscope, uh, you have very high fidelity in uh, looking at this. If you don't have it and you don't have, I mean, uh, you, you can estimate uh, and you can then compare with calculation and extract a number. And you can, by changing the number of atoms, you can also f see that this is changing with probably an error of 20% or something like this. But in general, uh, at the center of, um, I mean, uh, the, so in the central part, uh, you usually don't have uh, a lot of vacancy. 
then on the side, uh, let's say, or the border, uh, because the lattice is much bigger than what you actually feel. You just feel part of it, uh, okay? Uh, there uh, you can have more uh, vacancy. You can also have double occupied site. It's really depending on how you prepare your system. Yes. And so and now what, what actually, yes, we have done uh, is then to measure the energy difference between these two configurations by breaking bound of attraction or breaking bound of repulsion because this corresponds to different energy. And from this, uh, we could extract actually the values of the nearest neighbor interaction. Of course, it depends on the spacing of your lattice. If to put a much short spacing lattice, this interaction become uh, uh, higher. And there was a very good agreement uh, with the experiment and the theory. So all this now, I mean, uh, I'm kind of ended with my presentation. And this is, uh, was about giving you some example of physics you can do with, uh, with the uh, dipolar atom in the crystal and some example of what you can do with Fermi gas. And this is uh, the team in Innsbruck actually doing this uh, experiment. And now we have also a second experiment, which is a erbium dysprosium mixer. And as Max is here in the audience. And we just very recently achieved the situation to have a mixture of erbium and dysprosium atoms. So the first mixer combining two different highly magnetic atoms. We have magneto-optically trapped these uh, atoms. And the magneto-optical trap is working very nicely. And, uh, and so with this, I would like to, to thank you.